Alicia and howdy. In this video, we're going to talk about the differences between buying a home in the U.S. and in England. And speaking of homes, the reason why we're filming in our car is because our home is currently kind of torn up. Today's video is a follow-up to our prior video about our decision to retire to England and live there part of the year each year. And we mentioned the fact that we bought a flat in England and that that was a long, arduous process. Yes, it was. <laughs> um, it actually took us 12 months to buy our flat in England for a number of reasons, which we will reference in a minute. We wanted to talk about the differences between buying a home in the US and in England. And we have bought how many homes during our marriage? 20 homes altogether. 20, we don't own 20 homes currently, but in the course of our 32 years of marriage, we have gone through that home buying process 20 times. So we know a thing or two about what that's like. And we have bought one home in England and it was very different. <laughs> it was, yes. <laughs> because Ian is a realtor, we're going to have him do a lot of the talking about the differences in the transactions and uh, I'll chime in with my color commentary along the way. The first thing I want to mention though, is I'm gonna just get this out of the way because this comes up 100% of the time when we talk to someone in England about how strange it is buying a home there or, or how hard it was or whatever, they would always, always say, in Scotland, it's different. In Scotland, it's more like it is in the US. And we would say, well, that's nice, but we're not buying a home in Scotland. We're trying to buy one in Cheltenham, in Gloucestershire, in England. And we wish it were a little easier. Ian's gonna take us through several ways that the home buying process is different, starting with making an offer. When you make an offer on a home and the offer is accepted, you have a contract. And that contract is pretty firm, especially for the seller. The seller cannot back out of that contract for any reason at all. They are, they are stuck once they've signed that contract. For the buyer, there's a few contingencies that exist and those exist so that the buyer has a chance to do their due diligence and make sure that there aren't any issues with the property. But again, it's, it's understood that the buyer is going to follow through with the contract if there aren't any issues with the property. The due diligence period is quite short. Now in Texas, it used to be 10 days, but now it's seven days. So you- Is that the option period? It's called the option period here in Texas, mm -hmm. where you have the option of backing out of the contract that lasts for about seven days. Once that period is over with, um, there may still be a contingency for financing, for getting a mortgage mm -hmm. on the property, but other than that, you really don't have much of a way out of the contract as the buyer. And as a buyer, you will often get a pre-approval letter that you can share with the yeah. seller at the time you're making an offer. Right, that shows you have the ability to follow through with the contract. Right. If you don't have the financing, then you lose your earnest money, which is usually 1% of the value of the contract. Which is or a lot. You, can, <laughs> you can actually be sued by the seller and forced to follow through with the purchase. It makes things go much more smoothly, I would say. And quickly. So and what quickly. would you say is the average total transaction time from the time you make an offer to you get keys to the house? It, here in our area, it's about 30 days. Right. Whereas in England, it seems like it goes on for months and months and months, if it even goes through at all, which we'll talk about later. There's some differences in terminology. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, here in the US, we call the completion the close. Mm -hmm. um, we call uh, the survey an inspection. And that's something that happens with, like I said, within that seven day period. So if you're- When you're the, checking out the house to make sure yes. that it's okay and are there any issues. Yeah, so if you're the estate agent representing the buyer, you, as soon as that contract is signed, you're calling an inspector yeah. and trying to get them out the very next day. Cause you know you, the clock is ticking and you've only got that seven days to, to have the inspection done and have any repairs that need to be done agreed to by both buyer and seller. Let's talk about the the <clears throat> word chain, which is a big deal in England. <laughs> we have contingencies that can exist for the sale of a home, mm -hmm. but very few contracts have that, that I've worked with have had that contingency. So because, and, and explain what that is. When you're writing the contract, you say, 
I'm gonna offer you this much money and this is when I wanna close, but it is contingent upon the sale of, of my home. home. But that, that was very unusual for me to have a contract like that. Usually you don't start looking for a home until you've gone through that option period mm -hmm. selling your own home and you're mm -hmm. in a good position to be able to buy. Well, also it's because the market for a while has been pretty competitive. It's, so that's right. It, so, it, so some, a seller that has, you know, a seller that isn't going to accept uh, a contingency like I have right. to sell my home in order to buy this home. Right. They would. They just wouldn't even accept that. They'll just go and move on to the next person. And they're say, in a multiple offer situation. Yeah. Their ideal is going to be somebody who's paying cash for right. the property, mm -hmm. but you know, obviously, a lot of people can't pay cash, so mortgages are still expected. But um, but not a contingency to have your home mm -hmm. sell. Yeah. Because of that, it's rare to have a chain. In fact, it's not a. It's not a term that is used in real estate here in right. Texas. It's just not known. Or the U.S. at all. In England, when you're purchasing, you could be involved in a chain which could throw the whole transaction off. And for those in the U.S. that don't know what a chain is, it's when um, the buyer of a property has a contingency, um, which is that they have to sell their home before they can complete the purchase of the, the new home. And the buyer of their property also has a contingency and it could go so buyer on and on buyer one is one link in the chain. <laughs> they're yeah. trying to sell their existing home. Then the, they're, they're making an offer on this one, seller two. They've got a chain mm -hmm. before they can go. So this, the, all the links in the chain. And so, so it makes it a very fra it makes the transactions very fragile because if, if one person breaks that chain, then all the, the transactions down the line don't complete. Yes. Before we talk about how often things fall through, one other thing just overall that's very different is that when we bought a property in England, we had to hire an attorney to help us with that transaction. A solicitor. A solicitor. And here in the U.S., the way it's been forever, things are in the middle of changing right now, which Ian will talk about in a second, but the way it's been forever is that there's a buyer's agent and a seller's agent. So if I'm a buyer, I go say to a realtor, hey, I wanna buy a house, you wanna help me? And the real estate agent says, sure, I'll go take you around and show you a whole bunch of homes and you just tell me what homes you wanna see and I'm gonna run you all around and show you them and then I will represent you as you make that purchase transaction. The seller who says, I want to list my home also has an estate agent, real estate agent, who works with them and represents them and represents their interests. Well, since buyer's agents really aren't a thing in the in the UK, when we were- Well, they do exist, but you have to pay, you, the, the, the buyer has to pay to, to get somebody. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not typical. Like it's when not we, typical. When no. we wanted to go to Cheltenham, and this is a place where we hadn't really been there. We hadn't, we didn't know the areas, we didn't know the neighborhoods. So we were just doing massive amounts of online research and looking at mm -hmm. Google Earth, trying to understand different areas. And obviously we were on the real estate site for listings, rightmove.co.uk, mm -hmm. looking houses. And so for months, we were just getting to know the market, seeing what properties were coming online and things. But when we had our house hunting trip, we wish that would have been great to just have one person who ran us all around instead what do we have to do we had to go to each selling agent or listing agent and see the property or properties that they had that we were interested in mm -hmm. so it meant working with a number of different selling agents and we knew that they had the interests they were representing the sellers they weren't representing us mm -hmm. so they didn't have our best interests in mind yeah mind right so then when we found a property we wanted to make an offer on we made an offer and that's when we had to involve our solicitor to help us with all of the paperwork. Yes, but here in Texas, we have what's called a title company and the title company facilitates everything and they represent uh, the buyer and the seller equally. So when you close, when you complete a transaction here in Texas, you go to the title company. The buyer goes at one point, signs all the papers. The seller goes at one point, signs all the papers, and then it's complete. You hand over the keys and the transaction's done. Whereas in England, we completed the sale at the solicitor's office. Yes. So let's talk about the money. 
Let's talk about uh, up until recently, how commissions have been structured for estate agents in both countries. So very typically, um, the US had or has the highest um, transaction fees or, or costs that are involved with agents. Mm -hmm. Typically five to 6%, 6% actually is, is was Normal. pretty pretty standard. Mm -hmm. And that commission was paid by the seller. And what happened was their agent would agree to give usually half that commission or 3% to the buyer's agent. Mm -hmm. And they would advertise that with the property on the MLS. Now the MLS is another thing that is different mm -hmm. between the US and the UK. In the US, we have a system that's only accessible to realtors, but realtors can share the information that's on this system with their clients. So literally everything that's listed goes on this central database called the MLS, the multiple multiple listing service. Yes. Everything is listed there and it's like the secret keys to the kingdom. Only the realtors have access, but like yeah. you say, they send reports from the MLS to their clients. Yes. And the thing about the MLS is it has data going back years. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very easy to find out what properties have sold for in the past to be able to determine what the value of a property mm -hmm. is if you have access to that MLS. That's how you uh, do our, the comparative market analysis. Right. With right moves, sometimes they've got information about sales for a particular neighborhood, but it's not very complete. And it's also not very comprehensive. Mm -hmm. So, for example, on the MLS, you can see what sorts of concessions have been made by the seller to reach that price. There's, it's very, very specific, very detailed, the information that's, that's on that it's MLS. It's also searchable by a lot of factors. Different parameters. There's just endless yes. parameters yes. with which you can search. And it's required, um, the MLS, in order to be a realtor, you have to basically belong to this MLS and you are you have requirements as far as what you have to put into the MLS mm -hmm. about the properties and about what's happened with the transactions. Mm -hmm. And so you can't withhold any information whatsoever. And so for those of you who don't live in England, just to explain a little bit, rightmove.co.uk, there are other sites, but that seems to be the biggest one mm -hmm. that has all the current listings of homes for sale that is available to anyone as a public website. So right. as clients, as customers, we can all go there and search for properties within certain areas. Yeah. Um, there are websites like that in the US. Yes. There's realtor.com, there's Zillow, etc. But those are, you know, customer facing websites that are different than the MLS, which has way more data and is way more accurate. So talk about timing, like when a house is sold and the close is done. Yeah, it has to be put in the MLS almost immediately. Right, whereas it might still look like it's available on realtor.com or Zillow mm -hmm. for a few weeks after it. Right. Now contrast that to the commission structure in England. Yes, so I think that typically sellers pay one to two, maybe 3% to the- Typically one. I think it, when we were buying our house, it looked like 6% was average in the US and 1% was average in England. Right. So that's great as a seller because you're, you're, <laughs> you're obviously, the, 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 that transaction cost is, is significantly less. So tell us about how the laws have recently changed here in the US. Things have changed significantly due to a lawsuit which was enacted, I think, in Missouri where um, groups of sellers sued our national association and a number of brokers. And as a result of that suit, they are having to pay out hundreds of millions. The suit was alleging that the commission structure was fixed so that sellers were having to pay an inordinate amount. And that certainly could be argued when, you know, there was typically sellers were paying 6% to realtors on the transaction. So now what's changed is that basically the seller is no longer having to pay a buyer's agent. I mean, they can pay a buyer's agent, but it's now not allowed to be put on the MLS that the seller is offering to pay 3% 
for example, to a buyer's agent. That's, that's no longer allowed. But that was typical in the past. It was. It's going to be interesting. This is being enacted in July and it'll be interesting to see what impact that has because buyers are typically used to not having to pay anything mm -hmm. to a realtor mm -hmm. in the transaction. So the way that things have changed, it may be that um, the uh, buyer's agent will um, need to be paid by the buyer. And I don't, I think buyers are going to be kind of reluctant to pay thousands of dollars to buyer's agents to show them houses. Yeah. And, and, and especially in today's environment, the way that buying a home has changed over the last 20 years, now everyone's going online and looking at things. They have so much data available mm -hmm. to them over the internet. Back when we first moved to Texas over 30 years ago, we didn't know anything. It was a black box. There was no information. You absolutely right. relied on coming to town and having a buyer's agent educate you about everything. And you couldn't look and see all the homes that were listed or anything. Right. There's so much virtual tours that are available online. There's so much available online. But there are issues with not having somebody who's in your corner representing you in the transaction. Um, I feel kind of sorry for those estate agents in England only getting a 1% commission because the other overarching thing that's massively different, and we really noticed it from our end of being buyers, is that a lot of transactions fall through in the UK, way more than in the US. And we'll share those statistics in a second. So here you have this agent who has spent months trying to get a listing sold, and then it falls through, they don't make a penny that's really a challenging business. Yeah. Yeah. I would not be willing to be an estate agent in, in England. It, it's a tough business. So talk about what happened to us in our transaction on Evesham Road. In yeah. So we got strung along by a seller for five months. And during that whole period, we were trying to get the transaction completed. Mm -hmm. And she kept saying, kept delaying things, but saying that she, don't worry, I'm going to sell you my property. It's not going to fall through. It's and not so, going to fall through. And so then we did various surveys and inspections. We yeah. spent over a couple a thousand, thousand pounds. pounds yeah. Because there were like plumbing things and stuff that we had to investigate. We spent all yeah. this time. And then on Easter Sunday, she contacts us and says, I decided not to sell my flat because I feel like there's a chance I could lose my job. Yeah. I mean, and that should not be allowed. It shouldn't be allowed, mm -mm. but, um, in Scotland, it wouldn't be allowed. <laughs> well, and then the other thing is we felt sorry for her estate agent. Very sorry. I mean, she, he had spent so much time. I on felt like we were talking to him every day for yeah. months. Yeah. <laughs> Poor guy. And then speaking of our building and sales falling through, uh, one of our neighbors in our building sold his flat, sold in air quotes, his flat, last summer while we were there and we just found out that fell through after seven months of him thinking it was sold. So this really messes people up when it comes to moving house and planning their lives when they think that something's sold and then seven months later it falls through. So it's just kind of a crazy thing. So statistics on those sales falling through. I looked this up, very recent data that said that in the US about 5% of transactions fall through. But in the UK, it's more than 35%. And I'd also say that those 5% of transactions that fall through, they're gonna fall through very quickly. You're gonna know pretty quickly if the transaction's gonna fall through. It's because someone did an inspection and found out that the roof needs to be replaced and the seller says, I'm not replacing the roof. And then it's like, okay, fine, deal off. Whereas, 49% of the transactions that fall through in the UK. Why is it, Ian? Because the seller changes their mind. A lot of people change their mind and they get away with it because nothing is complete until completion date when both parties sign on their line. And up till that, people can just back out. Crazy system.
There are some pitfalls, I think, to how the agency situation is in England. You don't have anyone that's representing you mm -hmm. as the buyer. Mm -hmm. So in the U.S., as an agent representing buyers, I would always try to get the lowest price for my mm -hmm. for my um, clients on the property. And I would use all the data that I had on the MLS to figure out what that lowest price should be. And for buyers in the UK, you don't really have access to someone who can help you negotiate and get the best price unless you're willing to go and get a valuation done mm -hmm. for that, that property. So if you're British, tell us if you have purchased real estate, how you tried to get the information you needed or or get around this issue like how do you feel like you're prepared and know you are paying the best price possible for a property yeah and then the other thing that um is difficult is again when you're navigating things and you don't know um how things are done so for example we weren't really familiar with rising damp and the issue mm. that it is on in properties in the uk and so we bought this property that it was newly renovated. Everything had been completely redone on the inside of the property. Especially the bathrooms and the kitchen and everything had been painted. Yeah, and after spending a lot of money on surveys for uh, an another couple of properties, mm -hmm. we decided, yeah, this is this is all <laughs> nicely newly done. I don't think we really need to survey. It's yeah. all it's part of a part of an overall converted home. It's just one unit within one it. One unit within it yeah. and there's all these other properties that are there and we assumed that everything was supposed to be disclosed to us by right. the seller. We figured the structure would be covered by the equivalent of the homeowners association management right. company whatever. Yeah. And that inside, oh, it's all brand new. It it should yeah. be good. Yeah. And there, Come to it, find there out, there isn't a seller's disclosure, really, is there? I, I think there might have been a seller's disclosure, but I don't know how much how much teeth, how, what kind of teeth are in mm -hmm. that disclosure. Because here in Texas, if you didn't disclose something like you've got a rising damp problem in the house, you're likely to be sued. Mm -hmm. And and it's very likely that the sellers who sold us that house knew there was a rising damp oh, issue. Oh, they definitely knew there was a ri rising damp. They just damp. painted over they it. They just painted <laughs> over it. And so we didn't know it. Yeah. And we weren't savvy enough to mm -hmm. know that we should have gotten a survey done mm -hmm. with somebody that has a rising damp meter to make mm -hmm. sure that the rising damp wasn't an issue in the flat. Mm -hmm. um, Don't buy a Victorian home <laughs> without having the damp evaluated. So we did spend a full 12 months buying a flat in England. Part of the reason for that was us getting to know the area. We did go out for a house hunting trip, but that was a little bit pointless because everything that was on the market was not relevant by the time the sale fell through of the one we were buying. So we had to just buy things sight unseen with the help of friends and relatives in England that could go look at places for us. We did buy our flat sight unseen. Yeah, we did buy, we hadn't seen it. We hadn't seen it. People we trust really. had looked at it for us, yeah. but people, but we had not seen it. So uh, I will put in the description a link to our flat tour if you're curious to see what our flat is like that we did buy. And then there are two very interesting properties that we almost bought. Not the one on Evesham Road that we referred to earlier, but some interesting uh, period properties that had previously been other things other than domestic dwellings. So in my next video, I will share with you those two places that got away and you can see what they were all about. Thanks so much for watching this video. We appreciate your support and do something, do something good, good in the, the world, world today. today.